Thanks for coming along um, this afternoon. It's great to see everyone here. Uh, my name is Felicity Fenner. I'm the director of the UNSW Galleries, where at the moment we're very lucky to be hosting uh, the Sean Gladwell Collection Plus exhibition. Um, the exhibition opened last night. We've had a huge week um, g getting it ready. Mm -hmm. And have most of you had a chance to see the show? The students here, have you had a look through? Great. Great. Um, and if you haven't, there's a chance directly after this session just now. Um, uh, we're going to have a sort of uh, relatively informal in conversation um, with Sean and Greg Ferris and David Burns, followed by um, uh, we'll go across to the gallery where we have wine, beer and popcorn uh, for our very first uh, First Friday event. So we've got a new program in the galleries this year. On the first Friday of each month, we'll open in the evenings. We'll uh, plow you, with, play you with drink, and um, have different activities happening in the galleries. So it could be film nights like tonight. It could be performances. It could be like peach kucha nights, whatever. Different things on the first Friday of each month. So just put that in your diaries, and we hope to see you uh, throughout the year for that. Tonight's First Friday will kick off with a um, Video Forever session, which is curated by Barbara Poller and Paul Arden, who are uh, the curators of the Sean Gladwell exhibition and are visiting us from, from Europe just for a few days to oversee the install and the opening. So we're very happy to have them with us this evening and you'll get to meet them and you'll get to um, have a chat to Sean um, even more informally in the gallery directly after this. So let's get going. I'd like to introduce um, Greg Ferris here on my right. Um, Greg is a leading cinematographer and film editor in Australia and he's worked with some of Australia's leading filmmakers and visual artists. For over a decade he's been creating immersive and interactive film installations that have been shown in festivals and exhibitions here and overseas and he's also curated uh, festivals of film for Art Gallery and Biennale of Sydney etc. He's produced and directed video clips for many Australian performers and consulted on a number of feature films. Greg's own work, uh, his own work as an artist, has been exhibited internationally and, and here at the Sydney Film Festival and at Video Fest in Berlin. Greg, both Greg and David are lecturers at UTS and uh, Greg also, um, we know him from here, he got a PhD from Art and Design, then known as COFA, uh, just a couple of years ago, I think, yep. Um, Greg, as I mentioned, works closely with a number of visual artists in Australia, Susan Norrie, Julie Rapp, our own Dennis Del Favaro, and of course Sean Gladwell. G Greg um, is Sean's archivist in a way. Um, he's also his editor. I asked Sean, how would you describe Greg? And he says he's the man. Without Greg, I don't have a practice. So that's a pretty good rap. <laughs> I don't know if you said that. You just <laughs> said it a second ago. <laughs> um, we've also got in conversation with um, Sean tonight, David Burns. Um, David is also at UTS, um, where he um, is, um, what are you doing at UTS, David? Oh, you're a senior lecturer in the School of Design, and he leads the photography and situated media program there. Mm -hmm. David's an American academic, arch architectural designer, curator, and artist in his own right, and he's worked in leading design offices and institutions in the US, including the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, he has a Master of Science in Advanced Architectural Design from Columbia University. David's own practice deploys architectural materials in site-specific installations and has been exhibited widely in the US. And in Australia, there's been a number of group shows, including with our own Richard Goodwin, I think you, you must know quite well. And our third speaker is Sean Gladwell. Um, Sean, as you know, is, is one of this country's leading artists. And in Europe, he's probably the best known contemporary Australian artist at the moment. Sean um, probably shot to prominence, I think, with the storm sequence work in 2005, was sort of, which is now really an iconic Australian contemporary artwork, and was picked up by Robert Storr for the 2007 Venice Biennale International Exhibition. And then, of course, just two years later in 2009, Sean himself was representing Australia at the Venice Biennale took off to live in London soon after, um, where, where he's been based, um, based since and still is. 
So it's great that he's been able to experiment with these to come out to Australia for this exhibition. I first saw Sean's work next door here, um, soon after I started working here, nearly 20 years ago, I think it was the 96 Travelling Arts Scholarship. Yeah, painting. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so um, we, we've known Sean a very long time here at Art and Design and he, he did his um, undergrad at Sydney College then came here to do his postgrad masters in, in painting. He's an amazing painter and we've got a couple in the current exhibition and I remember reviewing it at the time at about the year 2001 or something for Art Collector in the Undiscovered section wasn't undiscovered for long. So welcome back to Art and Design, Sean. And if, we'll, yeah, it's informal conversation with questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, for, I'd like to uh, thank Felicity and Susan for organising this event. And this is a, it's kind of, a, as, as well as being a, um, a, a piss up for uh, UTS and <laughs> UNSW School of Art and Design, I keep wanting to call it COFA, uh, students afterwards, assuming you're over 18. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity to have a, a, an informal chat with Sean about his work and his art practice, particularly for students that are undergraduate and we've got a lot of first year, first semester moving image and, and uh, fine arts students here. Um, in, I don't know, who's seen the show at SCAF? Okay, so this joke's going to go over everyone else's head. I'm turning my uh, phone to flight mode um, in <laughs> honour of the, the, the show. And I wanted to start, Sean, by asking, you went to Sydney College of the Arts, a very fine establishment, not as good as UNSW School of Art and Design, but still <laughs> pretty good. And you came here to do painting. That's right. So when was that? Um, in the late 90s. Okay. I can be non-specific about the... The actual year, uh, yeah, it was the it was the late nineties, um, um, and I was a postgraduate student, and I remember I was studying on an Australian postgraduate award, and that was a thrill um, because it meant that I could really dedicate myself full time to uh, being a postgraduate student. So it was an incredible time for me, and it was very fertile. I don't, we don't have to talk about the Sydney College of the Arts days, because um, no, but it's, it's, uh, the you know, reason I, I'm leading into <coughs> it and. A lot of, a lot of uh, students who are doing undergraduate degrees, they start in one discipline and then at a certain point, maybe in postgrad, <coughs> they transition into a, another discipline. And I'm wondering about your transition from painting whilst continuing that practice into the moving image and how that came about. Yeah, I think it, I was definitely interested in moving image even as an undergraduate student. I remember having uh, friends who were a part of the sort of electronic temporal arts f faculty at um, Sydney College of the Arts and I would always sort of be hanging around them interested in the technology thinking about ideas um, in moving image but never having the kind of uh, the facility to do that myself I was always um, it was also a very intimidating and dark space in Sydney College of the Arts the the electronic temporal arts and um, it was, it was also um, equipment that I didn't have um, a real affinity with at the time and I would always ask um, friends to help me put little experiments together but it wasn't really until I was here upstairs in the old F block, in the painting F block, still F block, uh, that I decided to check a camera out and in C block, you went over the C block. C block, yeah, the, <laughs> which is a huge move for, for yeah. a painter. Because C block is, you know, that's another world, a whole conceptual shift to go to C. And, it, and I checked a, a camera out and I remember, remember thinking it was a little bit naughty because I don't think I had a technical proficiency test for that camera. Um, but it was a real on-off button experience. Yep. Um, I didn't need to work technically beyond actually turning the camera on uh, at that stage. And, and I actually produced a video that is in the show, in... in this show in uh, galleries UNSW, which is called Writing with Death. Very simple work. It's a, it's a low camera frame, and there's uh, a foot that steps onto a skateboard, and opposite that is a skeleton on caster wheels and a platform. That's the first real video piece I've made. So this is late 90s? 98. So 
digital DV cameras had been around for two or three years uh, and had been had trickled this, there was this trickle down effect with camera technology. You yeah. could get broadcast quality yep. Yep. images out of these cameras. <coughs> you weren't okay. allowed to borrow this camera, but somehow they managed to let you borrow this camera and you made this work. Yeah, actually, I, I had to start um, on a sort of uh, a more basic camera. That was actually a magnetic based tape loaded camera. We're getting kind of Get, is this a geeky enough? Uh, no, no, but there's a transition. There's a, there's a flip point in yeah. the mid 90s where things transitioned from analog to digital. digital. And you, you were post, post that. Yeah, yeah. Although I, I felt like I had one foot in the analog wor world just through this one work. It was the only work, well, there were two really that I shot on, on the old cameras. I guess Is you could even. SVHS? It was SVHS. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Uh, Pan Panasonic uh, M M M MS4 over the shoulder cassette loaded camera, which is a pretty intimidating camera because uh, they're actually big cameras, even though they weren't as complex as the new digital video cameras, which were much more com compact. Um, it felt good to have this big camera and I, I just literally put it on the ground. I had this skeleton that I checked out of the life drawing um, store and Kurt, I don't know if he's still here. Is he still checking those? Great, thank you. That was an amazing, I mean, you know, he let me have the skeleton for a little while and, and then I, I put my s skateboard on the ground and I still remember feeling very uncomfortable showing that work to people because I had a sock mark on my ankle from just taking my shoes off. So these little details started to bug me, but really what I was chasing was a few art historical references. One was um, Leon Leonardo's allegorical study, which shows this skeleton riding a, a horse. There's a kind of confusion about who's writing who, who's carrying who. Um, and then uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat did this great painting um, uh, in uh, 1989, 88, last work he did called Writing with Death, which is a kind of remix of that Leonardo drawing. And so this was my interpretation of those two um, historical coordinates. A very basic work, really easy. I didn't care about the soundtrack. I wasn't really even concerned about the framing. The, at the same time, 98, 99, um, and just to put it into the whole thing into context, there was a, a group of artists who came out of Scar and um, Kofa at the time, and they set up a gallery called Imperial Slacks. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the major sort of video and new media, for want of a better word, artists that around now, Angelica Vassetti, Alex mm -hmm. Davies, uh, Wade Marioski, mm -hmm. all came out of that. And you were, you were part of that group, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a warehouse in Surrey Hills and we, we weren't doing anything new because there was quite a lot of artist-run initiatives. But we were a collective, I think, that maybe were a little different in the sense that we lived in the space that we exhibited in and also opened for other curators or artists to exhibit in. So there was this... Um, this, I, this, there was this kind of domestic life, uh, which, you know, it was, it was a collective in that sense that we, we were all connected to each other's lives outside of the exhibition. And it, and it was also a venue for gigs. We had the What Is Music Festival there, the Now Now Festival. Quite a lot of um, stuff was happening in terms of music as well as um, visual arts. And so, yeah, it was, it was great to be around those artists. And I, I really met all of those artists in my um, masters. It wasn't through SCA. Uh, m most of those um, Imperial slackers came from yeah. what was Kofa. And um, yeah, it was great. It was pretty sorted though as well, you know? So no, it's we collective life. There. David, yeah. do you wanna, do you wanna well, I was just thinking, yeah, I, I can't, can't participate in the kind of Kofa SCA discussion. I wasn't around at that point. But I think it's interesting to talk about the transition from different types of media, because I think you and I are about the same age. I was born in 72. And we, yeah, okay. So there was a, uh, all of us went to school, I studied architecture, but it was all manual, hand-drawn hand things. Mm. We go out, we practice for a while, you come back to do your post-grad work and everything's digital. Mm. There was that transition happened in that short period of time. And I think that led a lot of our generation of designers and artists to not really worry too much about medium because we, we had been forced to kind of change medium. Mm. You know, we were, yeah. we were drawing and then all of a sudden we were modeling and then you kind mm. of go back to model making or whatever. Mm. And so it, that to me is really interesting. I would love to hear kind of more about, I don't know much about Imperial Slacks, but the, I asked you about music before because I feel like 
a lot of your early work references things that I know quite well, like wearing a Bones Brigade t-shirt. Mm. To me, that era was about DIY punk. It was about putting on your own shows. It mm. was the, yep. that amazing book, uh, Book Your Own Fucking Life. I don't know if you guys had mm -hmm. that down here, Maximum Rock and Roll, yep. that kind of stuff. Yep. That was a huge part of my yeah. time in that. Um, so uh, you mentioned like gigs, you mentioned having shows there. Were the crossovers totally fluid? Were there were people making music that were in your scene? Pardon me. Yeah, I think so. I think I, I mean I wasn't. Um, I went into the Imperial Sax Collective as a painter who was dabbling with video, but I certainly wasn't um, connected to to those practices. Right. But um, you know, I was interested in experimental music or you know what was like uh, pushing that language, mm. um, and also there were there were people who were coming into Imperial Slacks who were, who were writers and, you know, it was just a, a kind of a court of sorts that were, that was kind of um, mixing ideas. People were discussing everything from politics to um, their own aesthetics, you know, their own practice. And uh, I, I was, pr I think I was a pretty shy character and I wouldn't have had that kind of level of exchange socially unless I um, had a partner who was in the slacks and there was a whole kind of terminology we started to develop our own language as every subculture tries to do in yeah. it's a part of the self-imposed exile of sub subcultures i think you try and um, start to stake out difference through everything mm. appearance language whatever fashion so we we had this these terms that kind of like um you know colloquial terms and i was a strap-on because i was the partner of someone living in imperial <laughs> slacks and as a strap-on i had the kind of um, same rights as a slacker, a full member of Imperial Slacks, but I did have um, a bedroom elsewhere and a studio elsewhere, which was How much rent were you paying? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was good because uh, yeah, I, I could afford to just leave my place, which was in Burke Street, uh, which was really great rent. I can't, I can't even remember what it was, uh, below $70 a week. Yeah. There you go. That's the old That's Sydney. Right the shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but... Um, yeah, I think I think it's important. I think artist run spaces are important and Sydney's always had a yeah. very strong scene um, here. So and it still of course continues. Okay. If you're interested in Imperial Slack stuff, Campbelltown City Gallery is doing a retrospective show yeah. later this year of a lot of the Imperial Slacks artists. Um, which went under, uh, there was also called Herringbone at one stage and yeah, turned Tennessee. into Land Franchise Memorial Discotheque yeah. Yeah. after that. Oh, no, no, I was just, I'm, yeah, but recognizing but names. But even, I think maybe even in terms of like space, like actually Barbara mentioned um, Gaston Bachelard yesterday and the poetics of space. And I was thinking, it's interesting that you, we had say the institutional space that we all came from, which was this institution. It was, it didn't have the kind of infrastructure that it has now. This is an incredible um, campus, but we decided to have an alternative space. We decided to have our own exhibition space and I really like that DIY philosophy yeah. that, that came out of punk and then transitioned into grunge. And uh, for me, it was about the idea of um, not really waiting for curatorial support. Right. It wasn't really about waiting for um, uh, attention from anywhere else. We just generated it ourselves. And you know that build and they will come sort of s philosophy uh, took place on some level. Yeah, that ethos, it just seems like, you know, my high school years were dictated by whatever Discord put out, and and yeah, their sure. model of living, you know, we were playing shows with Fugazi, like we were that same generation, yeah. okay. and looking back now, you see how it affects everything that you do. Yeah. So, yeah. you yeah. know, when you have an when you have that kind of sort of, not only distrust of kind of systems, but that sort of ingrained independence, it allows you just to, yeah, to do whatever you want. So, yeah, like. I'm running a photography degree, but I'm an architect. That doesn't make me question anything. I mean, no, that no, makes yeah. perfect sense to me. It's fluid. Yeah, absolutely. I was even thinking like the, the legacy of um, architecture in Australia, like Imanz Tillers, a, a really great Australian artist came from architecture. Robert mm. Hughes came from architecture. You, you start to look at how many people cross the floor yeah. uh, within this period of their degree, and that's very exciting. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it just, um, so I think proves that you might enter uh, tertiary education not really knowing what you want to do, but you sure. find it through the process of um, <coughs> studying. I think that's a given. I think I, I, 
I wish it was a given at UTS, but I don't think we have that. I mean, people tend to come in now thinking they know exactly what they're going to be yeah. when they're set. Well, they are teenagers. It's terrifying. So it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Mostly. They're not taking the right drugs. I studied architecture. My parents told me to. <laughs> don't do drugs. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, can I go back to your childhood? And we talked about um, being in the womb yesterday and... and, and and, and do you want to recline? And fluids. Can you, can you lie back a little bit? Um, no, uh, you were both born in 1972. Um, you were born the year after Walkabout came out. Um, uh, two years later, The Cars That Ate Paris came out. You were 10 when Blade Runner came out, uh, which we talked about. Well, a fantastic talk yesterday. Uh, um, Tears in the Rain. Same year as... Same year as um, Blade Runner, Mad Max 2, The Road yeah. Warrior yeah. came out. Yeah, yeah. BMX Bandits came out. Yeah, yeah. Huge, you were 10. Huge, huge year. Um, yeah. Yeah. How much were you influenced? I mean, we talked about Blade Runner yesterday. Yeah. Um, BMX Bandits, wow. Brian yeah. Trenchard Smith. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously Miller. Um, yeah. Talk about that. So, were that, at that early stage, yeah, yeah, no, I think I, I think I was absorbing it, and and I think at the time you you watch uh, film, or you just soak in culture, and, and you you know it's it's a non-critical process because you're not thinking about thinking that stuff, but it goes in like you were saying on a, on a on a very deep level, and maybe it's only in in reflecting afterwards, maybe even in tertiary education that you realise the effects of that. Like the, the, the effects of seeing, you know, um, Angelo D'Angelo hanging out with uh, Nicole Kidman and that hairdo of hers, which is etched into my brain forever, thanks to uh, Brian's great directing. But also maybe the idea that it was showing um, kids in a very free space, you know, that, that, that there's that genre of, say, an adolescence coming to age film where, um, you know, kids that age are given uh, incredibly complex roles and they're treated like um, like any other adult character in other genres of film and that's I think uh, as a child it's extremely liberating to see that kind of representation in film it gives you kind of permission to enter a sort of imaginary space um, where you are dealing with fiends or you are where you practicing. could take flight as well it's like a line of flight absolutely Which the other, there's another famous BMX film that features a lot of BMX that came out in 1982 as well, called ET. Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, well, I just think having flashbacks of being living in Kentucky in 1982, it's, it's troubling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it interesting that even like I think this is the power of popular culture that we share those references yeah. across uh, you know Australia and North America, and of course Europe is involved in this as well. That we we have that common language mm. through the transmission of those those images. So it, for for me, it's a it's an incredibly powerful thing to recognise because uh, of we, we're both crew of seventy two, but we and we come from different contexts. But that that is a common language, yeah. and I play with that with my work. Obviously, I'm I'm interested in um, you know art historical references, but when I draw upon personal experience in my work, I'm drawing upon that stuff. Mm. There's the um there are connections between all, I mean, as, there's a bit of a, this is a long bow to draw between E.T. and Mad Max the Road Warrior, but I'm going to try. Um, if we go back to Gulpalul in Walkabout, we, we talk about Mel Gibson before he went insane in, in, in Mad Max 2. Um, we talk about E.T. They're all wanderers. Yeah wandering through these various environments and, and, and sometimes they're lost mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how that ties in because you also reference um, painting or, or mm -hmm. painting in your in your moving image work so obviously Mad Max uh, filmically uh, Ned Kelly with the helmeted yeah. character yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to talk about the Wanderer which is the Casper um, uh, David uh, Frederick Yep. Painting that yep. you you reference. Uh, I don't know. If the, is that image of you on the mountain in this yeah, show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, all wanderers. Um, quite often, these characters you don't see their faces. No, that's ever. Right. Yeah. Uh, in the in Mad Max, 
the first Mad Max, you don't see Gibson's face for the first 20 minutes of the film. You no. just see slits That's right. in the rearview mirror. That's right. So, so yeah, very Nolan-esque, you know, yeah. sl slot helmet box yeah. Kelly style. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, if you talk, could talk about the idea of the Wanderer, um, because you do spend a lot of time on planes. Yeah. In yeah. in this sort of non in this non lost on lost in trans, trans uh, yeah. uh, tra not translation but yeah. um, in, uh, but there's you are sort of lost in this this space yeah. and a lot of these characters are also lost. I mean the yeah. children in Walkabout, for instance. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one, and I haven't prepared for that at all. No, I could question. I try that. <coughs> um, <coughs> my goodness! Wow, I'm a uh, um, okay. No, that's good. Um, yeah, no, being lost, I think, is a very productive space. Like, you know, there's that, there's this philosophy that doubt is fertile. And I think that being lost, I if you can try and induce a kind of um, wandering, uh, like, say, the Situationist International with the derive, this idea that you, you, that's a tactic, like an artistic tactic that I think I was practicing before I even knew that um, as a, you know, as an artistic strategy. Or you have, um, you know, Baudelaire and this notion of the flaneur. I, of course, I, I refer to those in my work, and I, I love this idea of wandering, or an ambling, or whatever. And then, of course, we have indigenous references to that, but I make no claim to that. That would be a, a, a terrible appropriation of, you know, in terms of uh, walkabout. It's, it's. Um, but I do um, think that, on some level, when I was at art school. Um, learning about um, indigenous practice, I love this idea of um, walking some sonic way of mapping. You know, like a like the idea of a, a song line was so incredibly powerful conceptually. So, I did a series of works that were very early video works where I would um, try and record uh, wanderings, and I got a really a mini DV. Um, you know. Um, camcorder, which they were kind of marketing as palm quarters at the time, you know, handy cams. So you, you, there was this idea that it was not really throwing you off balance. The, the technology was very ergonomic. And I would just really just shoot my skateboard and I would be tracing uh, road markings. And that was probably the closest I came to try and record uh, a wandering. And, um, and, you know, it was kind of like my version of a, a video drawing or a tracing. And um, although the, the indigenous references would be very ambient, and I'm, I'm not making any claim, any uh, um, direct association, because equally as important were the European references to wandering. So yeah. Uh, and also I think as a teenager, I was, yeah, I was lost in the suburbs. And, um, you know, and there was just that incredible concrete expanse out there. And the, uh, the Australian artist Jenny Watson would always say there's something incredibly violent about Australian suburbs. And, um, I sort of found a kind of poetry within that sort of urban banality and violence. There's something, because you can activate it through these processes. You can either kind of succumb to it um, and maybe even retreat from it, or you can go into it and start to author that, like through, say, graffiti in, in a very direct way or in a performative way through uh, skateboarding or BMX riding. And so um, those activities always involved a certain kind of uh, wondering. I hope that sort of answered something. That does answer the question. I always wanted that. I always wanted to know, and now you've answered. <laughs> there you <question>. go. <laughs> that that kind of uh, almost kind of segues to the the new work over at, at Sherman and the discussions you were having yesterday um, about um, that sort of transitory moment of being on a plane and mm -hmm. and there was very quickly a discussion about Bacon and Deleuze and it just happened like that and then the subject changed again. And it, it struck me so much when I first saw the major work um, in Sherman with the, the raised plant, the pedestal, the mm. solitary figure, mm. well, assuming there's a participant in the chair. Yeah. And it reminds me so much of, of Deleuze talking about the kind of the cube or the circle or the, the yeah. isolating figure yeah. within Bacon's work. Yeah. Um, before I, you know, I might just put my foot in my mouth right now, but has, have you done a lot of work that's had such a spatial component? Like that's really, I mean, the, the, the mist screen has to be there. It's purely site specific. The location of the plinth in the middle of the floor raised up perfectly on the metal grate. 
Yeah. These, these feel so um, architectural, but they also, to me, reference that Deleuzian mm. understanding of Bacon. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, this is definitely a different approach for me, because yeah. I, I think that um, with SCAF, it's a very generous commission. I probably haven't had the opportunity to work on this scale for, for a while, uh, well, locally anyway. Mm. So yeah, no, I've definitely um, thought in different spatial terms, just through th purely through the opportunity. Yeah. But no, but I think that there's been um, an interest in the site and and positioning. Maybe another example, like where say I needed a grid because that was kind of my Bacon-esque reference to yes. framing. Um, and you know, um, the idea of the frame that Deleuze goes into when he references uh, Bacon's uh, remix of Velacquez or whatever mm. was very um, potent to me, and I, but I had to come up with my own language. Yeah. In, in the same way that I, I tried to work out my own position on, say, you know, Basquiat on Da Vinci. I mm -hmm. couldn't just, uh, be, it couldn't be a, a, a very close facsimile. I, I needed, I needed a, a position. And so um, I'm trying to think. I did a work, I was just explaining to Barbara before, um, this work where it's a very small work, but I think it's important spatially. It's a human skull behind a monitor, mm. and the skull slowly rotates. And in the foramen magnum, which is the hole underneath the skull that attaches the spinal cord to the skull, is an endoscope. And you don't get to see the source of the image. The, the skull is this you know, object s slowly cycling behind the monitor. But on the monitor, you get a live feed of what's going on inside this human skull, which is a, it, it kind of looks to me like a limestone cave or mm. the surface of the moon. And I think that um, that idea of me trying to push, like, say, Vanitas or Memento Mori or some, mm. some tradition in art through maybe a very simple technological apparatus, but then still having the source of the image there, that, that's probably maybe the closest I've come to working in this way. Because mm. uh, it's, it's not like a performance that's recorded out on the street. It's, uh, it's something that I've, I've, does, I've formulated for a, a gallery or a museum space. Yeah. So I'm really out of, uh, out of my depth here. Yeah. It's well, terrifying. <laughs> well, it's, it's amazing um, to, of course, last night it's quite crowded and there's a bunch of people circling this, this plant. And I quite enjoyed that performative aspect of watching someone, you know, don the raincoat, become a semi, you know, anonymous, mm. sit down, and then have this relationship that's, of course, mediated by the rain, but have this relationship with someone who is really in peril. Yeah. Or that's the that's yeah. the inference. Yeah. And so that to me, that those isolating moments are so. Mm. There's just a really amazing mirror there mm. of kind of. Uh, of peril and isolation, mm -hmm. and I thought I thought it was really great because that's what I think about architecture. But I thought it was great that there was that moment where you had to kind of, mm -hmm. you were raised, mm -hmm. you were you were not on the gallery floor anymore. Yeah, yeah, you kind of undergirded or enframed somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but um, but actually, I, I was thinking of like um, trying to have some sort of sort of tactile, sensorial relationship to the image, which is usually something that's distant from us. Or now it's like handheld, we have a relationship to it through our body with devices. But um, I remember this really great movie from the 80s, the Kentucky Fried movie, bad humor, a lot of fart jokes. But there was this one skit in it, which was kind of like this sensorama film skit. I, and I'm gonna paraphrase, and I'm kind of distorting it in my memory, but these people come and sit down in this small cinema and uh, they watch this film, but someone, like a cinema attendant, s sits behind them, and they've got gloves on. And so there's this scene in the film, which is off camera. Can you remember this scene? I do, yeah. And, uh, and someone's <laughs> smoking, and she's going, hey, careful with that cigarette. And there's this like blowtorch behind every single person <laughs> watching it. The, and they go, whoa. And they go there. So they, this person is kind of like juggling all of these props uh, behind you as you see it on the and it, it was kind of absurd comedy, you know, it starts to get more and more extreme where uh, the man in this, this scene is getting um, questioned about lipstick on his collar and then the, the attendant grabs the collar of the viewer of the... And so, and, and so that was kind of, but for me, like I watched that and I think, yeah, that was really funny. But on some level, I thought, wow, how do you activate images? Right. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, think, how do you think about images in a performative way? And, um, 
So really, it's, that whole work is probably about the Kentucky Fried movie. <laughs> Which the, the hum, humor is probably really bad now, like The Office or something is so much better. But um, yeah. yeah, as a kid, it was, it was cool. Tying, tying that into the idea of having someone behind you doing stuff, um, one of the elements of that, that installation is, is the screen at, at the back of the chair. Mm -hmm. And right. what, what I found interesting out, out of, because um, I, I was prepping some of that material for you, for, mm -hmm. for the show, is that the material, the, the image that's the largest resolution out of everything that you shot for this piece yeah. is is shot at 5K on this red epic, is the smallest image in the yeah, whole show. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Whereas, um, hmm. and, and yeah, so I'm just wondering, in terms of thinking about the, the mists, if, if for those that haven't been to the show, um, sh as you walk into the gallery space, there's a, 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 a mist uh, screen that you have to walk through. So you're literally walking through the, through the image. Hmm. Um, I'm just wondering about your choice of doing something as w strange as giant image, small screen. Yeah. And yeah. I, 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 I assumed it might have been a Sunset Boulevard reference where the, the pictures yeah, got yeah. smaller, but it's actually a Kentucky yeah. Fried Chicken <laughs> uh, uh, movie, Kentucky Fried <laughs> movie reference. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've brought the references down, down a bit. <laughs> down so <enough>. the question <laughs> is, yeah. choice of screens, sizes, and materia materials in terms, because you've also projected on glitter, Screen, uh, yeah. uh, uh, curtains, um, yeah. Yeah. and mist. So yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because um, I, I was thinking about that. I think it's maybe uh, more born out of stupidity, really, because I, I could have shot the smaller screen work on an iPhone and, uh, and the resolution would have looked great. The fact that I'm using a cinema grade camera to produce something on a small screen does not make sense economically. It makes um, sense if you're on an airplane and you're watching all these Hollywood blockbusters sure. yeah, that are shot with the same camera. Yeah, yeah. And really what I wanted to do was insert that text, this film has been modified to fit this screen. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I've wanted to have in, in front of a, a video artwork. But um, no, I think and, and there's also a kind of flexibility to the image, like we're sort of almost future-proofing work now that you, you feel, and I don't know if anyone else feels like this, that you try and use the latest technology because you know it's about to be outdated after you blink and um, and so like say a sensor that is recording at say 5k on a red epic with incredible an incredible lens which you would sort of see recording drama for Hollywood now um, will be the Panasonic MS4 cassette loaded you know um, you know, analog camera, yeah. So, yeah. and so the that, but that small screen is, is interesting for me because what I really love is that you know, for like a long haul flight, your your attention is just like really focused on this very small yeah. window. And and also what I love is that the screen moves. Like in an, in economy class, I love that thing when someone retracts their seat and you go, I'm really close to this screen. Now I'm really close <laughs> to this screen, you know, and it's great. It's great. It's like uh, you could lick the screen. And um, I wouldn't advise <laughs> that. <laughs> no, no, no. Usually, I'm crying over the screen. That's usually the source of tears. Is that a? Uh, but um, but no, it's it's um, it's it was just um, something that you, I, I just feel obliged to do. Shoot it on a big camera and um, degrade the image through framing later. Okay. Should we open up to the to the floor? It's quarter till. Can I um, see that thing about? The size of the image. Yeah. Um, at the back of the chair, you had that little image. Yeah. And then you, you saw the much larger image in front. Yeah. At what stage do you decide on the size of projected image? And the follow up from that is would that smaller image work on a larger screen? Yeah, no, it's interesting because I, I, I have like an understanding of where I want images to go. But then the, that work will change in the next. Are you the guy that asked the question yesterday? Yeah, that was a good question. And this one is also equally stumping me. Um, so anyway, no, it's probably, it's probably uh, my understanding of what size an image is. And, it, and it's a very arbitrary thing. It's a very emotional thing. There's no formula. And um, 
if it was peer reviewed by some other process, then it would be shot out of the water. I can't really justify why things are big or small. Uh, I, this is like the kind of metaphysical margin for artists. I can say it's, we used to talk about license or th this, the space itself is a muse. Scale, scale itself as a concept is a muse. And at the moment, I really love this contrast between um, the small and the large. And other people talk about the idea of like temporality being perspectival. You know, like so, so if it's slow motion for me, um, that gives you a different perspective on the space itself. So, so my understanding of a slow motion image that's on a f iPod or a phone is an immense representational space. It's huge, even though it's a thumbnail. It's kind of like the grain of sand kind of metaphor. It's like an aperture into a bigger world. So, but then other, other images need to be larger um, for no particular reason. I'm sorry, I can't answer you. That follow, following on from that, why slow-mo? Uh, Temporality? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a good one. Well, the, 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 and tying in with the, 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 the latest and greatest digital camera, when you started out doing slow-mo, mm -hmm you were having to uh, invent frames, mm -hmm. but you were shooting at 25 frames a second. Yep. In order to do slow-mo, you were interpolating those yep. frames and putting in frames that weren't there That's in right. between. Yeah. And now you're at the stage where you can actually shoot at these high frame rates yep. and play it back normally. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. So you're shooting at 240, on an iPhone, you're shooting at 240 frames a second, yep. playing at yeah. 24, 25 frames a second. Yeah. Yeah. How how that change from f making making up frames yep. to actually having the frames? How yeah. has that affected your practice? Yeah, no, I, I think it's still it's still the same concept for me. It just looks better now <laughs> because the technology is better, and I I have a major problem trying to justify why I use slow motion to curators, and um, the thing with me is because I think I came through video at it in the 90s and at that point slow motion became like a trope it was like mm. a signature if you slowed down an image you were somehow in 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 conversation with bill viola uh aesthetically and because v viola at that time were and still is um an institution unto himself uh there was no there was no escape velocity from bill viola you know and um that was a problem for me but i still had to chase slow motion regardless I didn't want to stake out some other space because actually it wasn't Bill Viola that was the, the influence. It was um, action sports replay. And, nice. and, and yeah, it was, it was like everything from cricket to skateboarding to surfing. It was that moment that you would see a sequence of action on television and then they would show it to you in slow motion if that broadcaster had the ability to do it. They were probably frame doubling in the yeah, yeah. in the early days as well. They're doing it on tape, they're just slowing the tape down. Just A B roll, whatever, just roll it slower. Yeah. And and for me that was incredible. Um, you know, when people talk about like like say hip hop um, being there was this breakbeat that would come in between these other phases phrases or all this and they just wanted the break. Yeah. You know, they just wanted to keep the break going for the the entire song that backbeat, they just wanted to strip it all down. For me, I, I didn't want to see real-time uh, telecasting or real-time sp sports broadcasting. I don't want to see that. I just wanted to see the slow motion action replay for the whole whole game. Yeah. And, and I kind of gave myself that um, opportunity through video art. But, but, it was, but it's really tough to define that aesthetic against the almost, like, it was like the dominant aesthetic in video art in the 90s um, so I, I'm yeah it's a tough one yeah. and even the Bones Brigade videos from the 80s I mean those when those videos came out I mean David, yeah. yeah we would just sit there and just wear them out and yeah. and that was you, you couldn't believe you were seeing those tricks the way they were being filmed because before you know they were happening like that and if your friend did one and you were in front of him or her, you missed it. That's and, right. And all of a sudden you could see them. And yeah. it's just like yeah. all of a sudden there's Lance Mountain. You know? Of course. Yeah. Well, I think that the ability to slow down video actually progressed the entire sport yeah. because people could start learning right. the tricks that the professionals were doing through video analysis, through, yeah. through a kind of forensic um, dice, dissecting of these tricks. And, and one of the biggest uh, moments for me aesthetically 
and I don't know, we haven't even talked about the Bones Brigade until just two seconds ago, was um, in this film called Future Primitive, which came out in 84, 85. Yes. Um, so yeah, a little bit later than um, the other key influences, there was a sequence by uh, Rodney Mullen. It was the second video of the Bones Brigade. You know, the, this is the second Powell Peralta production that he was in. And the entire sequence of Rodney Mullen skating was, was, uh, was in slow motion, and that was a revelation to me. And I, I, at the yeah. time I watched it, I was old enough to want to do it. Yeah. And then later, as an artist, I just wanted to replicate it. And I haven't... Before you would have just about to be a teenager so perfect time to start yeah, breaking for, bones formative yeah, yeah yeah and also i i think in terms of influence i had no defense against that Ro rodney mullen's entire slow motion sequence i hadn't seen uh that that before the, the, yeah. the his his video part in the former bones brigade video show was in real time but something happened stacy peralta the director of that film ha had this brilliant um idea that the, 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 the maneuvers were so complex that the only way anyone would really be able to understand them was in slow motion. And that was it. That was like, uh, I haven't actually been able to progress from that moment. <laughs> I'm not sure if I, even if, in terms of telos or wanting to go forward, why go forward when that's the moment I, anyway, that's a- That's rather. when I realized I could never skateboard the way they were doing it, but I wanted to be in the bands that were on the soundtrack. Because back then, yeah, skateboarding yeah. and punk were, completely intertwined yeah and a lot of guys in the the videos were also in the bands of course and that's when i was like okay yeah i'll just yeah. be the drummer <laughs> <laughs> if i skateboard i'll break my wrist and then yeah <laughs> oh no but it was, i think it was a whole package it was the yeah. music and it was a you know they're selling it as a lifestyle and i bought it wholesale yeah. but also i think as an australian i felt very separate separate from what was happening in north america and it was probably after punk in terms of just getting into music and maybe this is just boring for people um, who, who were kind of born in the 80s or 90s. whatever, 90s, yeah. Sorry, yeah, 90s, what am I yeah, saying? Just Shh, whoa, anyway, um, uh, that, you know, you, it was kind of probably grunge. We had good punk, of course, in Australia, and also there's this theory that Australian punk was good because we had 240 volts out of the sockets right. for amplification. Of course. So you think of like, say, um, the Saints, ACDC, yeah. Radio Birdman, it's 240 volts. It's pretty serious in terms of it. So, but, but anyway, after, after that, th something happened where, you know, we had uh, grunge as a kind of like uh, uh, secondary response or whatever. Yeah. And you had like, say, sub pop uh, mm. recording out of Seattle. And then you had Flying Nun, which was maybe just a little bit before out of Dunedin in New Zealand. And I was thinking, this is great. Here's a movement which decentering yeah. music. Like, you know, like th there's these centers of activity um, where I could probably include myself maybe artistically because I'm from Sydney, I'm not from New York or Paris or London, no offense to people who are based in Paris, but <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like it was, a, it was kind of an empowering movement because it was about margins. Right, you could be anywhere and you could do that. Anywhere, pre-internet thinking about being anywhere. And it's almost even better if you were from somewhere weird and small. That's right, you can market that right. as exotic. Yeah. <laughs> Still am. I'm looking for hands, hands up. Anyone's, yep. Uh, Sean, with your, with your multi-screen works, um, how, do you, how do you think about the relationship between the, the various screens? You know, does it change the cinematic language for you? Uh, the multi-screen work, yeah, I think um, sometimes it's important maybe to express the idea on several screens. That's, I just, that's the basic thing. It can't happen through a single channel of video. Like there needs to be, Nick Cave once said like in this, uh, this recent film, I think it's called 20,000 Days on Earth or 40,000? Yeah, 40, yeah, that was 20,000. 20, 20,000 Days on Earth. He said that it, for him, the process of songwriting is all about counterpoint. That you know, you, you have to put like a Mongolian psychopath in a, in a song with a small child and just see what happens. And then if that doesn't work, you introduce a clown. If still doesn't work, you shoot the clown. There's a beautiful series of images. And for me, I think counterpoint is like really important because um, like say in the work downstairs, in, um, it's called Double Voyage, which I produced in, in um, Brazil for the Sao Paulo Biennale like in 2005. I couldn't just have a single channel of like the skateboarder in that film. There needed to be a counterpoint and um, I don't want to go into that why. It's like, because um, it's a pretty boring rave probably, but 
the, the idea needed to have a conversation with itself in another body. And so, yeah, and, and also like maybe even the multi-channel works, they're kind of like exquisite corpses. Like sometimes I don't know what I'm going to do in the next screen and you kind of, you know, you kind of catch yourself out. Um, so sometimes multi-screen work is exciting for me in that way. I hope. Um, Another question? Um, so when you make your works, uh, when you make your works, um, are the works you make normally which you like the most? Are they normally the most popular, or how does that kind of work with? Um, popularity and kind of when you make your works do you kind of know it's going to be you know a real winner and all kind of thing or yeah are you that cocksure that you would you you i got no idea man you've opened up a can of worms I, i've got no idea i'm like the last person to know i mean i i think maybe i don't know like felicity mentioned storm sequence and um that that process was like me wanting to maybe chase Rodney Mullins sequence out of uh, Future Primitive, this video that I saw as a kid, and thinking, well, how can I map Rodney Mullins aesthetic onto a seashore kind of Turner-esque romantic landscape? How could I connect those two? And so it was a personal exploration of mine. I asked a friend of mine to shoot the work. The storm came in, the camera got wet. The end of the video is when the camera stopped operating because it was waterlogged. That was a Kofa camera. <laughs> Panas, uh, it, was, yeah, it was a beautiful uh, Sony TRV 900. Oh, they're expensive. Um, I think we've got a bill um, somewhere to give you. I'm waiting for the invoice. So, anyway, so that was that. That was how the work was produced. You know, it was a, it was an experiment, and I had no I idea that that would become a work even actually. And um, so yeah, I, I don't. What you're talking about is like. Um, Maybe a Duchampian idea, where the where the audience completes the work, and in that process, I can only ever hand it over, and then posterity judges, or it's a more immediate process. Um, I've got no idea. I mean, yeah, I can I, I know what I like, but that's usually always the opposite to what John McDonald. He will always hate everything. I know that. So in art school, um, in terms of like. Um, thinking of a popular work, we would reverse uh, John McDonald's uh, reviews and say, uh, you had a great show if John McDonald hated your show, you know. Um, and yeah, I, I'm still perplexed by that process. Anyway. Got time for one more question and up the back. Um, I remember seeing a piece of work of yours at the Biennale, the Sydney Biennale on Cockatoo Island a few years ago. And that was you, yeah. <laughs> and I remember you were taking questions and there was a circle of people around you just firing questions at you. It was like some kind of strange form of torture or something, I don't quite, interrogation. What I'm saying, as an artist, I guess the question is, how do you deal with interrogation like that from so many directions? You, you're kind of involved in that, that, that same interrogation just by asking me. <laughs> You're not on the outside of that subject. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, I, I think that artists have to, like, they, they have to generate the propaganda for their own work. You know, we, I, think, I, think that, I think the term in corporate culture is like, you know, image management or something. There's probably, there's probably, a, there's probably a course on that that I, um, I don't know about, but... Um, um, yeah, the idea of trying to talk about your work, it's tough because that's the reason why I chose visual art is because I'm not good about talking or writing about my work. So there's the paradox. I don't know. I, I like this artist um, from Germany. He's a painter. His name's Kai Althoff, and he lives uh, outside of Cologne. He doesn't have any connection to the internet. If you want to communicate with him, you write to him. And uh, he's, he's probably the worst at trying to justify his work, but in not doing it, he sort of does it. You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't matter what you do. If you can do it in an extreme way, then somehow it works. Um, so, I, yeah, but I remember being um, harassed at Cockatoo Island. Thanks for thinking of me, man. <laughs> do you want to wrap up or? Yeah, are there any more questions? Oh, we've got one more. We've got one more. Has, if I may ask. Hmm. 
Thank, thank you very much. I actually would like to ask uh, student questions because many students are here and I think they don't dare to ask the basic questions that really interest them. How do you become Sean Gladwell? Or I mean they don't want to become Sean Gladwell but how, how do you get where you are now starting from where you were 10 years ago and um, you can't just answer them I don't know because uh, you know they want more they want some they want some real stuff from inside that you know how 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 do you do this like on a, on a professional level or an artistic level artistic level well I guess they're kind of intertwined but Yes, uh, well, okay, so professional and artistic, please. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, seriously, I mean, the, the question is far too uh, um, big to organise a response um, to. But I also want to sort of claim an unknowingness, because I, I think that some artists, artists are, are very good at um, career strategy, and there's this great work by uh, conceptual, post-conceptual artist Ryan Gander, uh, who's a British artist who um, he has this he has a it's an A4 sheet of paper and it's it's a kind of a map or it's a sitting arrangement scheme for a dinner and after dinner party after one of his exhibitions and he's scrunched it up but he's kind of let you be able to read that he's got people curators um, gallery directors in a kind of s seating plan and it's called career guided missile it's a fantastic work and I, I laughed um, at this work because I can kind of see that that's the strategy that artists have. You know, they, re they really plan out who they want to be associated with and whatever. But I, I, um, I think I've just been lucky in my association, maybe not so um, guided, unguided missile maybe. I don't know what, but um, I think coming here at this particular time to this institution and associating with uh, Imperial Slacks um, unwittingly connected to incredible artists. Uh, that was a real inspiration. And I was challenged. I was challenged by people like Alex Davies, technically. He still gets me. I don't know, you know. Or um, Angelica Mazzidi or uh, Emma Price and um, Tasha Noble from the Kingpins. You know, the, in terms of gender politics or, you know, cyber feminism was huge at that time. I, I was just challenged and I think that really helped, helped me. And, and they still help me. I think it's that basic. list that you just said is like the golden age of, um, of, of, of moving image art. Soda Jerk as well. Soda Jerk, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, they, they were associated with the Imperial Slack. So, yeah, I think it's just, I think it's just um, getting the right help. It's only it's about an individual autonomous. Um, I think that, that, that philosophy is out. It's not, about, it's not about someone like whoever. Greg Ferris or Sean, whatever. I it's think about it's about peers. the you about your peers and learning from your peers and, and being um, supported by your peers. And you had that with, with that yeah, yeah. fantastic group of artists. Yeah, but I think it starts here in these environments, of yeah. course. Peer supports are very important, kids. Don't take drugs. <laughs> Thank you.